Great. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jenny. I manage the Run Walk program at SportMed BC. Um, today, we're doing a, a webinar on a, um, running or well, common running injuries and injury prevention. And I'm here with Laura. I'll let her introduce herself. Um, yeah, you can. Why don't you take over? Um, introduce yourself and tell us what you're going to talk about. And uh, yeah, thank you. Sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Laura McNeil. Um, I'm a physiotherapist. I'm working at Alan McGavin, the North Vancouver Clinic. Um, so I've been trying to participate in Run Club, but I'm doing the presentation today. Um, so like we talked about, just some common running injuries and injury prevention. And I think the plan is if there's any questions, you guys can just type it in the box or wait until the end and then feel free to ask anything. Um, I'm going to go from there. I'll just see if I... Okay, so hopefully everyone can see it. I look okay. Yep, I look good on my end. Yeah, feel free to use the chat box, anyone, and I'll run to that if you have any questions. Okay, so perfect. Uh, so the general outline is just to go over some common injuries. Obviously, there's a lot of injuries that can occur with running, but just the more, more common and prevalent ones. Um, we'll talk a little bit about injury prevention. Uh, return to run after injury, and then just some resources at the end. Uh, so this is just a list of common injuries. So um, top three is some knee injuries. Um, typically common ones are shin splints, ankle sprains, um, some Achilles injuries, as well as um, kind of on the bottom of your foot. We'll talk a bit more detail about each of these though. Okay, so some common injuries for the knee um, include uh, patellar tendinopathy, so basically your kneecap um, and your quad tendon that runs over top of the kneecap. Um, so just the muscles in the front of your thigh that work to um, straighten out your, your knee. Um, and then typically we get pain right underneath your kneecap, um, common with loading. Um, so kind of when you start squatting or doing any, any sort of those motions. Um, also IT band syndrome. Um, so the IT band is just kind of a thick band of fascia that begins kind of at your pelvis so that your hip and then runs down the outside part of your thigh and crosses the knee. Um, so it's common overuse injury and can come, become irritated. Typically, you get pain on the outside of your knee with that one. Um, and then a really common one is just something called patellofemoral pain syndrome, or sometimes we call it PFPS. So again, it has to do with the kneecap. It's more of kind of a diffuse pain underneath the kneecap. Um, and then there's some, some exercises we'll talk about that can target it. Uh, typically, we call the knee the stupid joint of the body. Um, so it kind of follows whatever your hip or ankle do. So we kind of use a holistic approach where we assess your hip and your ankle uh, to kind of offload the knee, as well as a lot of exercises that focus on glute strengthening. So those muscles around your pelvis um, and so it's not always just targeted at the knee, but kind of looking up and down the entire chain. Um, so these are just, we use these, I just took these off of a program called Physiotech. Um, so just some very common uh, exercises that you can do. The first being in the top left corner, a hip flexor and quad stretch. So muscles on the front of your hip. And then again, those muscles on the front of your thigh um, can become quite tight. So this is a nice one to do um, as warm up or just to get a little bit more mobility in the front of your leg. And then clamshells is a very common one we use in the clinic. It targets one of your, one of your glute muscles called your glute med. Um, and so that one's a really important muscle for stabilization of the pelvis and typically kind of helps to avoid your knee from dropping in. So it just helps with that alignment of the knee. And then the progression for that is sometimes I like adding a side plank with it. So you get a little bit of core engagement with that glute activation exercise. Um, and then another kind of common exercises are, are um, putting a band above your knees and just doing walk side to side. Again, targeting more so those glute muscles. Um, obviously there's a ton of exercises you can do for the knee, squats and things like that. Sometimes it involves offloading, kind of depends on what stage you're in. If, if it's a very new injury or acute, um, typically we offload a little bit, give it a bit of time to rest and then gradually load. Um, so again, if, if it hurts to load the knee, then we do some some glute isolated exercise such as the clamshells or sometimes people have heard of glute bridges. Um, and then we kind of progress from there. Um, for the lower leg, common one people hear about is shin splints. 
Um, so typically you get pain along your shin bones, which is kind of in the front of your uh, lower leg. And it's kind of just due to inflammation in the area. Um, a lot of the time we prescribe things like calf stretching. Um, sometimes you can do a little bit of self-release on the front of your shin, sort of depends on what muscle is causing the problem. Um, and then you can also do some self-release with the lacrosse ball. Um, there'll be a picture on the next slide of it. Um, so in the bottom left corner, you can see just a very common calf stretch. Another one you can do is putting your uh, heel on a stair and kind of dropping it down just to feel a nice stretch in the back of your leg. Um, in the top right corner, uh, just your tibialis anterior. So that's the muscle that just sits right on the front of your shin. Uh, that can be a culprit for shin splints. Sometimes it depends on where they're coming from. Um, but, but typically, again, this is when uh, the muscle applies excessive or repetitive tension um, at kind of the attachment site to the bone, and then it just gets inflamed, and that's why we call it a shin splint. Um, if it's not treated properly and it goes on for a really long time, it can turn into a little bit of a stress fracture. Um, and so we really want to offload, make sure you're rehabbing it properly. So again, if any of these issues come up, you can always talk to a physio or healthcare provider. Um, and then the last one I just added was some single leg balance, just making sure working on some of those smaller muscles. Um, I'm going from there. And then for the ankle and foot, a uh, really common one again is an ankle sprain. Um, so typically if, if you twist your ankle, um, we sprain the ligaments that are on the outside of the ankle. Um, sometimes it can swell up quite a bit. Sometimes it depends on the extent of the injury. There's different grades of ankle sprains. Um, and then again, that will in influence how long it takes you to recover. Um, there used to be kind of a lot of thought around like complete rest and icing it a ton. Now we kind of just do more optimal loading. So early, early mobilization, which just means early movement as much as you can tolerate. Um, sometimes people will do ankle bracing for short periods of time. Um, but really it's just kind of keeping it moving. Um, and then again, that optimal loading. Um, with any of this, it's good to talk to your healthcare professional or physio. Um, and the next one is just an Achilles tendinopathy. So where your calf muscles in the back of your leg attach to is just a tendon. So it just means from the muscle belly and then it attaches onto the bone. And again, sometimes we can get inflammation in that area just from some repetitive stress. So if you have pain right in the back of your heel, um, sometimes that can be what it is. Uh, we focus a lot on some stretching of the calf as well as gradual loading. Um, so we see some calf loading. Um, there's different types of exercises uh, broken into kind of like an isometric. So you're not moving the joint, but you're contracting the muscle. And then concentric where you're shortening the muscle and then eccentric um, where you're strengthening while lengthening. So if you go up into a calf raise, that's slow lowering. Um, and then the last one, again, very common is kind of a plantar fasciitis. So um, just kind of that dense tissue underneath your foot. So you tend to have the layer of skin, layer of fascia, and then the muscle. Um, and sometimes that fascia can just become quite irritated. Um, again, it's just a band of connective tissue underneath your foot. Um, the most common symptom is if you uh, have a period of rest and then go to take some steps, you get pain in the bottom of your foot. So typically people will say the first few steps in the morning out of bed are the worst. Um, and again, treatment, uh, a lot of stretching and strengthening of the calf because it's all kind of connected. Um, decreasing your volume of running, so if you're doing too much. Uh, proper footwear, I'll touch on footwear a little bit later. Um, and then you can also do some rolling out of the bottom of your foot with a lacrosse ball, which I think I put on the next slide. Uh, so that's the top one. Um, so I find tennis balls are a bit too soft, golf balls are a bit too hard, but a lacrosse ball is kind of a, about the right, right amount. Um, shouldn't be painful, but you can kind of just do a little bit of self-release on the bottom of your foot and should feel good. And then again, we have that calf stretch. So there's a few different ways to stretch your calf um, and then calf raises as well. So really focus on strengthening. Um, again, the key for some of these is a little bit of time with rest, but still doing some stuff. So, um, and then doing some exercises as well. Um, so injury prevention. Um, so the major one is kind of that gradual loading and running progression. So um, not just starting and doing 10 miles or whatever amount, uh, sudden changes to load uh, tends to be the most, in fact, most important factor in, in preventing an injury. Uh, commonly we'll see uh, people saying a 10% increase, so that 10% rule. 
Um, so just kind of gradually starting with like 10 kilometers, then you're only doing one extra kilometer the following week. Um, so it's quite slow or can be quite slow, but over time you build up that load in a, in a safe way. Um, fueling, so proper diet and nutrition definitely play a role into injury prevention as well as recovery from injury. Um, so avoiding some, some inflammatory foods and, and alcohol consumption, things like that. Um, recovery, so making sure, again, has to do with load, you're not doing too much back to back. Sleep is a big one, especially coming out now where uh, the importance of recovery and injury prevention, letting the body have time to rest. So if you're not sleeping a lot, that can, that can definitely influence it. And then a big one too is just watch out for those warning signs. So if you're noticing a ton of increased discomfort, you start running um, and you're getting a lot of pain, um, then we have to incorporate some stretching or release, um, strengthening kind of different areas of the body to help offload. Um, or taking a bit of time off before uh, you come back into it. Um, I have a lot of patients who come in and they say it felt really good throughout the run and they get a ton of pain after. So just making sure even if it feels good during the run, you're not doing too much because sometimes they can, you can pay for it a little bit later into the next day. Um, and then this is just a running progression resource that I like using. Uh, so it's actually through the running clinic. You can go on and, and pull these resources up. Uh, it's available online to anyone. Um, and it just talks about a little bit of an interval program. Um, so if you want kind of just like a starting basis of, uh, if you look at the interval program one, uh, week one talks about five minutes of walking and then an interval where you do one minute walk or one minute run, one minute walk, and then another five minutes of walking to end. Um, sometimes I'll tell patients to kind of start out with some of these interval programs, especially after an injury. A lot of people will kind of go back too soon and flare things up. Um, so sometimes it can be a bit tedious, but uh, it's kind of the best way to, to measure your volume and, and do that gradual loading. Um, yeah, and there's a few risk factors for, for injuries. The biggest one would be if there was a, if you've had a previous injury, you are more prone to another one, and especially if it wasn't rehabbed properly, you're kind of not getting to the root of the issue. So again, with something with like a, with a knee injury, if you're not strengthening your glutes or addressing your ankle mobility, which could be contribut contributing to it. Um, it can, you can still be susceptible to another injury. So making sure you're kind of knowing how to rehab. Again, you can talk to a physiotherapist. You can kind of do a full body assessment, make sure you're getting to the root of it rather than uh, just offloading and then trying to get back into things and causing a re-injury. Um, and again, yeah, training volume. And then sometimes we have some non-modifiable risk fac factors such as age and gender. Um, sometimes females are a bit more prone to, to knee injuries. Uh, but in general, if you're starting out slow and doing that gradual uh, progressions and making sure you're incorporating some strength training, um, then running's a great option. Uh, so footwear, so there's this huge debate around footwear, uh, but uh, really the summary is there's no conclusive evidence that one shoe prevents injuries. Um, there's a lot of debate around, uh, sometimes you get shoes with more cushion, some that uh, have more structure support, so they kind of prevent your your arch from collapsing in. Uh, generally, I just tell patients whatever feels most comfortable or if you've had good success with running shoes in the past, uh, just because there's no specific one that we can say, oh, this one 100% will prevent injuries. Uh, there's also a big difference between uh, like some of those minimalists, some people believe in barefoot running, and then the opposite end of the spectrum again would be those cushion shoes. Um, so I always tell people, make sure you try shoes on in the, sh in the store. Um, if you can run with them before purchasing them, obviously it's not to the same extent that you would be running outside or those longer runs, uh, but you really want something that's comfortable. Um, sometimes depending on your foot or depending on where you're at, uh, we can provide you with kind of like an individualized, um, what works best for you, but there's never that one specific shoe in general, kind of shoes with some support are better. Um, some of the conditions like plantar fasciitis and some of those other ones, uh, Avoiding flip-flops or shoes without any support is usually, usually good. So you do, you do want some support in general. Um, we can talk more about footwear if anyone else has any specific questions. And then again, so as we talked about before, strength training, uh, it's a huge component of rehab. Uh, with all my patients, I make sure to incorporate some sort of strength training. Uh, so we talked about that glute, so the core. Um, I always like incorporating some dynamic movement 
um, into your exercise routine so you can kind of see your alignment. The picture on your right just shows um, when the knee drops in a bit, sometimes it can cause a little bit of excessive stress onto that inside of the knee um, and sometimes can cause different injuries from that as well as a kneecap uh, isn't tracking properly, which can again cause that PFPS, so that patellofemoral pain syndrome. Um, and again, if you've had a previous injury, like I've talked about before, uh, make sure you're doing the exercises that, that are right for you. So depending on where that issue is coming from or what's going on with your body and what injury you have, um, really making sure you're incorporating some strength training that, that's most appropriate for you. Uh, so I talked really fast, but the overall summary, it, number one, listen to your body. Uh, so if you're feeling like something's tightening up, uh, you're feeling a lot of pain or discomfort or getting pain as you're running or after runs, uh, make sure you talk to someone or, or kind of figure out what's going on. Don't leave it for a long time because usually if you leave it too long, it's harder to rehab than if you get it addressed right away. Um, gradually increase your duration, intensity, and frequency of your running. Definitely incorporate strength training into your routine. And then again, talk to your physiotherapist about any pain or concerns for that individual guidance to help prevent injuries. Um, and then I just wanted to mention uh, another colleague of, and myself, uh, her name is Michaela Jurgens. She and I started this at five minute physio uh, Instagram account. Uh, and we actually make videos. So if you go on to it and you have a certain injury, you can just click, quickly click it. And it just goes through a few simple exercises uh, for you to be doing. Like I said, you have to know what injury you have to look at them, uh, but it's a helpful resource. And if, if any of you guys have Instagram and, and want those quick videos, just as a resource, we also do a lot of strengthening videos and kind of just some different exercises, exercise routines, as well as some articles um, that we review. So again, just kind of a resource for you guys along with that running clinic resource. Um, and I'm not sure maybe these slides will be available if anyone wants to review them. Um, but yeah, I'll let uh, about 120 right now. So maybe if anyone has any specific questions, we can go through those. Um, again, I know it's a lot of information in a short amount of time. I have a question. Um, sure. You can hear me, right? Um, so many of our participants are doing a learn to run program and many of them maybe are, are starting a run program for the first time or for the first time in a long time. Um, and would you say it's normal or natural that they would start feeling some aches and pains? Um, and, and if so, if they do start feeling aches and pains, when do you know the difference between kind of resting and when you should go and see a, a physiotherapist, for example? What would yeah, you so, so yeah, there's something called like delayed onset muscle soreness, which is called DOM. So if you are kind of starting a new thing, your body's not used to it, obviously you will feel a bit sore. Sometimes you'll feel a bit tight. Uh, typically I tell people if they're running and their pain is going up and up as they run, uh, it's a sign of, of something that may need to get checked out or if that pain is lingering. So if you have pain into the next day um, and generally with delayed muscle onset soreness or delayed onset muscle soreness, so that DOM's just that typical soreness, if you keep moving, uh, it should subside. If it's not going away and you're still having pain next time you run, you're noticing it, uh, that may, might be more of a sign of injury. Typically, I'll, I'll differentiate more of that just kind of like discomfort, muscle soreness that's typical after working out versus pain. Uh, so if anything is sharp and shooting, uh, if you're getting aching pain at night, or if uh, you get any numbness tingling, then that would definitely be some, some signs that I would say talk to a physiotherapist about. Okay, thank you. Um... David has uh, posted a question here. Well, first of all, he's asking if, um, will, are you happy to share the PowerPoint with me so I can share it with our participants? Of course, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll send that out to people. Um, and then he's also got a question about hip injuries. I don't know, David, do you have a, is there a particular question do you have about hip injuries? Or um, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask, and ask Laura. Right, yeah, I can talk about a few hip injuries as well. Can you do that? <laughs> I think he. So, David? Or are there any particular hip injuries that you see that you, for runners or in runners, I should say? Yeah, I mean, sometimes we'll see, um, you can see like a, like a gluteal 
bursitis or tendinopathy. So um, again, similar to that, we, we want to do some mobility exercises, make sure you're strengthening properly, doing a lot of core, glute kind of combined exercises. Another common one is like a hip flexor strain um, or hamstring. Those are more like typically seen for sprinters, but it can become an overuse injury as well. Um, so again, that hip flexor stretch, similar to that, I go back and do a bit of like a hip quad stretch. Uh, so in the top left corner, um, so one of our quad muscles crosses our hip and then the other one's kind of deep in our hip and attaches onto our lumbar spine. Uh, so it depends on which hip flexor, but uh, that's a common one and, and doing some release. Again, we would start out with just maybe some, some isometrics. Um, but again, hip flexors, I find if I do some glute strengthening, it can help offload those as well as just like some gentle stretching mobility exercises. Um, typically like the cartilage in the hip is, is more like changes over time. You can develop um, same with the knee, like some osteoarthritis or kind of those degenerative changes. Um, and again, strengthening and kind of staying moving and, and measuring how much you're loading those joints is, is the typical treatment. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Doesn't seem so. All right, great. I have a quick question. Okay, there's someone. <laughs> if they can hear me. Hi, um, thanks for that, Lawrence. That was really good. Um, I had a question sort of related to the hip. Um, I've noticed that in myself, I do need to work on my glute med glutamine. My abductors are not brilliant. Um, and I find when I run, my legs sort of cross in over each other. Do you ever recommend like widening your stance as you run or messing with that at all? So yeah, it usually depends on the person. So everyone runs a bit differently. No one's gonna have that perfect alignment when they're running. Uh, sometimes it can, like it's, it's genetics it can can be congenital so kind of the shape, shape of your hip joint um so it, it would it would depend i'd have to see you run obviously but uh if you're finding you're quite weak and you're noticing your knees are dropping in you're getting pain or you're noticing that glute weakness then it, it probably would be something we would address so incorporating some of that strengthening um and trying a little bit different uh way of running uh there are there is some evidence that if you do a bit of retraining of your running it can help with injuries so it, it depends on the extent of it as well and then some people just naturally go into like a different running pattern no one's gonna have the exact same um so yeah again didn't really answer your question but it would depend and yeah there there are a lot of physios who will do kind of those running assessments so if you go into a clinic and actually go on a treadmill um but if you're finding you're getting pain or you're noticing that a lot of weakness in your glutes and that's kind of causing it uh, then that would be kind of my number one to address sometimes if you just do some strengthening it can also help help with the the running pattern itself perfect some more clamshells <laughs> yeah <your> clamshells <laughs> yeah. <laughs> day, all day, yeah awesome thank you so much um do you guys do do you do running assessments uh laura uh, Ella McGavin? yeah there's definitely a few people who have taken specific courses um, I will typically get some patients on the treadmill, but I know Alan McGavin, uh, there's a few therapists, I think a few in the downtown location, as well as um, Chan Gan at UBC campus. I will specifically do like full hour long running assessments. Okay. Who do you, who would you suggest um, do a running assessment? Is this someone who has issues when they run or is it just kind of for curiosity? Like what, what, how can you help, I'd say? Yeah. So again, if you're, if you're getting pain with running, uh, no matter what, like I said, I would, I would always put someone on a treadmill so I can see how they run. Uh, but if, if you've never had one before and you're noticing like you're kind of having this progressive pain and you've tried physio or you've tried strengthening exercises and you're not noticing a difference, then, then it would be a sign to do a running assessment. Some people will do it as a, like a prevention. So going in for a running assessment, especially if they haven't been a runner, they haven't tried running a lot before. Um, but I'm always on the side of if you want to do prevention, then it's a good idea. Um, but if you're not getting any pain, you feel pretty good, you're, you're kind of doing that gradual loading and you're not noticing any issues, wouldn't necessarily be something I would, I would specifically say you should for sure do. Um, but yeah, definitely if you're getting a lot of pain and you're kind of not getting to the bottom of it, then, then it's definitely always something to consider. And if you're going into a physio they, and you're having pain with running, they should, should look at your running. Okay. Thanks. No one else has any questions. I think that's it. Thank you, Flora, for um, joining us. And yeah, I will pass. Uh, I will post the, the recorded video of this and the um, 
slides for people to review. Perfect. Okay. Great. Have a nice Friday, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.